This is going to be a wide-ranging, all-encompassing discussion. If that's all right? Yes, yes, thank you. First of all, who would you say is the most tragic of Shakespeare's characters? Oh, well, that's very interesting. I think the most tragic probably is Richard II because he has so many bloody lines to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that he doesn't stop yakking from the minute he comes on stage. He can't keep his bloody mouth shut. <laughs> I'd only say this because I have read the play. <laughs> and I have even directed the play in New York with a very good actor his name escapes me for the moment. Uh, it'll come to me. Uh, but he was very, very good. Now he's a famous movie and movie star. And I was asked to do it in New York at a place called the Public Theater. And I'd never uh, really studied the play before. Mm -hmm. And um, I had my own way of working. And my own particular way of working is in complete contradistinction to every other director <laughs> because their, their mandate, their commitment is to help you to sleep. <laughs> and they do this by making the dullest background so all the actors who are not the stars stand around holding spears or running along a bit going, wah. But my particular theory is to take actors and make them the star, the ensemble, mm -hmm. to create the background and to create the atmosphere. Then the audience get involved. And so that's what we did uh, with Richard II. And, um, and that's why I think he is tragic, because his life is tragic. And perhaps I don't want to go on too much. I don't want to bore you to death completely. But um, because he's self-obsessed, he wants his power and he wants his adulation and he wants the respect, you know, that all those kind of uh, archaic, naive, you know, upstart aristocrats loved and still do. And uh, he couldn't get what he wanted and he started to steal other people, uh, other people's land and he stole Bolingbroke's land and he invaded Ireland, and then he had his comeuppance and was thrown into jail, and eventually he was executed. So that's a pretty sad character. <laughs> now, who's next? Well, I was going to say to you, if I may, yeah. I've always regarded Lear as the greatest, or the, the most tragic character, because he goes from being the king and he becomes the fool, whereas the fool comes out with all the wisdom and his decline is terrible, and it's like Gloucester, he's blinded, then he can see. I just think that he is perhaps the most tragic. He gets it completely and utterly wrong on every level. Well, I think that's very good. I think Lear is, first of all, he's an effing bore. <laughs> 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 and he only has one great scene when he tries to combat the storm. So he's in the storm, he exiles himself uh, from his family, who he feels have rejected him, and his daughters don't love him enough. And he's just like an old uncle, an old grandfather, and when he gets to the storm and he says, you know, how, 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 he does this, how, blow winds and rack your cheeks. So it goes on like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, other than that, he, he's a flaming boy. He goes on and on. Oh, dear, they're not loved, they're not loved. It's like Shakespeare was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he repeats, I'm not loved, I'm not loved, my daughter don't love me. Or how more bitter is an unjustified uh, uh, daughter, how bitter as much as a, as a serpent's tongue. And so I thought, get off. <laughs> Think of something else, you old sod. <laughs> and he, he's an effing board. I'd never want to play Lear 
He just stand there and say, who loves me the most? And the, it's a bloody give it up. <laughs> but in England, they, they cling to these old stuffy, pedantic plays. Do the good ones. Macbeth, great excitement. Coriolanus, excitement. <coughs> Hamlet, a bit of a bore. I did Coriolanus for O-Level, actually. No one ever does it nowadays. No? Yeah, the, probably the oh, last Oh, you did tragedy. it for O-Level? Yes, and then did Lear and the Tempest for A-Level. Wow. Mm. What do you remember of Coriolanus? Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't work for me in the way that other Shakespeare tragedies do. It's a do. heavy going it piece. Is, it is. I Too much politics. Yeah, yeah. And difficult when you're 15. My yeah. God, I was also fortunate that you had such an opportunity at your school that they gave you that to study. Mm -hmm. So obviously a good school you went to. I went to Latimer. Is that good? Pretty good. Yeah. Well, I'm still here anyhow. Yeah, I've you got are. Life. <laughs> you are, well, I think that's very good. I like Coriolanus. There was a film made recently in England with Ray Fiennes, mm -hmm. you may remember, and Gerard Butler. Of Coriolanus? Yeah, oh. I'm sure nobody in this room has seen it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Oh, there's a couple. Yeah. And it was miscast. Because Coriolanus is a superhero. He's dynamic, powerful, fearless. And Ray Fiennes is very delicate, really. But he tried to be superhero. And by emphasizing all the words, you know, sounds a bit posh. And, and uh, Gerard Butler is. He's powerful and brilliant. And he did a, a film called 300. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody here saw that. <laughs> yeah. And he should have, he was a built, made to measure Coriolanus, but because he's not of a star, Ray Fiennes did that. And the reason is that in the theatre, maybe film in this country, we don't <clears throat> trust power, strength. To people like, you know, maybe uh, Sylvester Stallone or all these, um, these people are very popular in America, these um, great old actors of Paul Newman's. We like people who are slightly fey, they play the heroes. So they, you know, they're like, they're good at it because they speak the verse, but they're not, you would never dream of someone like, I wouldn't like to say his name, but some of the actors who play Coriolanus defending your home. You'd run a thousand miles. What would you say if I was going to cast Arnold Schwarzenegger as Coriolanus? Perfect. Thank you. No one's ever thought down that road, have they? They haven't, yet yeah, he's fantastic. And all you have to do is coach him in the text. The text isn't that great. And you can coach him line by line. And he has the power to frighten you to death. <laughs> so, you know, have him. Excellent. Excellent. Absolutely. We've sorted that one. Good out. Arnold. Um, actors, you have worked with thousands of actors. You've directed thousands of actors. You've written for them. Who would you say has been particularly outstanding under your tutelage? Well, uh, I, I think that uh, there have been a few that have been, I haven't, you know, I can't remember all that many. Get out. <laughs> Get, don't come back. <laughs> Well, that's the rest of you sitting still, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I think I directed and I taught when I directed as well an actor called Anthony Schur, mm -hmm. who's the big star of the RSC. And he did a production of mine. I directed him in my adaptation of Franz Kafka to the novel called The Trial. Has anybody read that? Oh, yeah, good, good, good. More people than saw Coriolanus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a fantastic book and an amazing writer of incredible imagination and so moving. And I was thinking of doing this, you know, a stage version for many, many decades. And eventually I did. And Anthony Sher, who was a big star at the uh, RSC, <coughs> he, he played Joseph K. And I think he's gone on to do many, many other things since then. So he played, he was, he was one of them. Uh, there was, uh, well, you know, this chap, chap who played Richard II, I can't remember his name, is Jewish actor. He's a very charismatic, 
sensitive, and he's a New York actor, I can't remember. But then I directed Barishnikov. Oh, Mikhail Barishnikov. Yeah. Oh. In uh, another Kafka piece called Metamorphosis. You probably all know that story, don't you? It's horrendous. It like, it like precedes the fly. Except it's a man, you remember Jeff Goldblum and the fly? Mm -hmm. It's a man who changes into a beetle. He changes into an insect overnight. Kind of very symbolic. In a sense, he felt himself to be maybe an insect that his father, who didn't respect him, made him feel lesser than a man, lesser than a human, or the values of a human being, and then suddenly wrote a story about a man who wakes up one morning and changes into a gigantic insect. It's, if you, do you know that story at all? I'm aware, but aware it's, of it, it's not yes. what I've studied. No, no, well, you, it was one day, and it is a most frightening story. And um, I did it, well, I played it myself originally, many decades ago, and then I did it with Tim Roth at The Mermaid. I was watching him in Reservoir Dogs just the other night. Oh, yeah, it's good. It's very, very good. Very good. And then he wasn't getting much work in England because he was maybe a bit too working class and too clever and too tough. And so that doesn't go you know, with the establishment theatre, <laughs> you know, and all that. It's terribly middle class. <laughs> and, you know, that's a shame. They should be a bit more open, you know, a bit more embracing. Uh, but it, they are a bit nervous of the working classes. But um, Tim Roth then wasn't working. He did a, a fairly remarkable beetle. And, <laughs> uh, and then he was out of work. So he went to L.A., they call Hollywood, and never stopped working. Mm. And now he's a major star. Yeah. Tarantino obviously spotted him. Oh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> so we, those were the people. I'd... Could we talk about you've moved us to Hollywood? Yeah. Perfectly. Can we look at your time as the go-to villain in major Hollywood movies? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been going so well for nearly 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. No, right, well, fir first of all, you were cast in, as Orlov, General Orlov, in um, Octopus. Octopussy. Yes, yes. And following on from that, before you knew it, you were Victor Maitland in um, Beverly Hills Cop. That's right. And then you were starring opposite the man you mentioned earlier, Sylvester Stallone in Indeed, Rambo. Indeed, yes, yes. I, I don't suppose getting typecast bothered you one iota. Not a bit. But the paychecks were good? They were not bad. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't great because I was still in the early stages of my career as a movie actor, and therefore they didn't want to kind of increase it too much. And so they, you know, they didn't want to spoil you. But I, by chance, um, got this role in, uh, I think it was Octopus, you, yeah. you mentioned, uh, Barbara Broccoli, like me, uh, for some reason. And, and because I have a slightly Russian name, they cast me as a Russian villain, uh, General Orlov. And that wasn't bad. And so I was dying to get to LA. So one day I just went. I had a friend there I could stay with, and uh, she put me up for a few days. And uh, I say she, so you know, it was a friend wasn't no, I'm not gay. And um, <laughs> so then I, they were casting uh, Beverly Hills Cop, and the casting director saw that I was in LA because I was put up for the job by my agent. And uh, I, was, I went along for an interview for the director called Martin Bresk. And I, 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 was, I was very, you know, a bit cocksure because I thought, well, I'm not going to get this movie. And, and I even said, I don't think it's a very good title, Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> Sounds a bit silly. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, people seem to like it. And, uh, <laughs> and then I was doing a play out there. That's why I was so somehow arrogant because I didn't need you know when you're doing a really good play you don't need to do movies you can tell them to suck it because <laughs> when you're doing a play you're a king even if you're playing for 50 people or 100 people a night 
because you know that no one of those film actors could do what you do <laughs> on a stage. They couldn't come near you. That's what I used to think. <laughs> <laughs> and so one day, I was doing the play called Decadence, which became a very famous play, and I eventually made a movie of it with Joan Collins. I had to have her because they didn't know the producers needed a name. And um, I, we did it, and that's the feeling you have as a stage actor. You, you know, even if you're poor, you, you feel a sense of pride if you can hold that stage for an hour or even more. And then the director came in one night. I didn't recognize him because I'd only met him. And he came backstage, so I thought he was a, like a, a member of the audience. So he said, well, I really, I really like the, the show. I said, oh, thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> And then, oh, I said, oh, you're Martin Bress, of course you are. Guess. And so I got into that, and that was, um, you know, with uh, Eddie Murphy. But before then, it was going to be with Sylvester Stallone. Oh, he was going to play the Beverly Hills Cop? Oh, yes. Oh, he was going to be Axel Foley. He, was, he was cast. And um, as everybody now here knows, if you've read any gossip, he was cast. And by that time, Stallone was a very, very big star, and he wanted to close off the entire freeway for a big chase. And, a, and the producer said, that we weren't having that. So he said, well, if I don't get it, you know, I'm going to walk out the picture. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they said, well, go on, F off. Because <laughs> uh, they're getting fed up with him. So they said, well, we've invested, we've got all the cast. And I thought, well, I'd bust me over because I had the job as a villain and uh, now they're going to have some other, but, you know, and they, they couldn't find an actor who was free within that time slot because it was supposed to start in four weeks. <coughs> couldn't find a white actor. And somebody said, well, you know, there's Eddie Murphy, although he's not a white actor, but he's just had a huge hit in 48 hours. Yeah, before that trading place. Yeah, yeah, and they thought, well, let's take a risk. Cut the Love Life, which existed with Sylvester Stallone and the girl in the art gallery, scrub that, mm -hmm. and have Eddie Murphy. That's how he, that's how it started. And that was his big, big, huge, huge yeah. Because, and the reason is, is the script had to be changed, <coughs> and the writers didn't have time. So Eddie Murphy said, "Yeah, it doesn't matter. We just improvise." And that's, that's so he said. Then Martin Bress said to me. The director, oh, you know, are you okay if, <laughs> if he improvises? And I, I said, because I live by improvisation, I said, oh, I don't mind in the least became very English, because when you're in Hollywood, you become very English. <laughs> you know, to sound as if you're, you know, intelligent. <laughs> oh, no, no, Mr. Press, I'm very, I'm happy with that. No, no, don't mind. So he would come with those improvisations, and I would come back with them. And Murphy, who was a top improviser mm. in Hollywood... Well, he started on Saturday Night Live, hadn't he? Of course he did, yes. And he kind of responded that, well, it was good. And uh, we had a very, very good time together, and that was... And then from then, Stallone, who was originally going to be the part, and had cast me, because originally I had to meet him uh, in, in Hollywood, and there's in the office, and there was a long desk about 10 times as long as this. And you know, I went in to meet the producers and the S S Stallone, you know, Stallone sitting there. And <laughs> there was the producer and the casting director and the assistant <coughs> casting and the wardrobe and the costume. I was there to see what he's like. And the, the backer and the co-producer and the set designer and the camera. There was like 12 people behind the desk. And I'm just sitting there in my little English blazer. <laughs> and, you know, Stallone said, hey, you know, I like, you know, I really like the way the English did. I like the actor, you know, because, you know, the English, forgive my, not, not a very good impersonation, <laughs> but not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, thanks. Thanks, pals. And he said, you know, I like the English actors. They had these great voices. And... Um, Oh, I said, well, thank you. Well, you know how that happens. Um, you see, in England, when you finish a show at night, you go to the pub, often it's about half past 10, quarter to 11, 
if you get to the pub by 10 to 11, you know, you're, you're shouting for a beer because it's <laughs> yes. going to close any yeah. minute. So he said, well, beer, please. He said, that's how to do it. And he said, oh, you did very funny. You did very good. <laughs> and I think that's how I got the role. <sighs> you know, you just really, you, know, you disillusioned me there. <laughs> and then he cast me in the... Uh, the Rambo. Rambo, First Blood 2. Yeah. yeah. How can you have First Blood 2? It's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it, really? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I've, can I ask you about... Because I'm going to throw this open to the audience, so I think I might have some questions for you. And I haven't mentioned Doctor Who, because if you want to, that's fine. We got, we've only got 45 minutes, so... I was watching an old American mini-series from the very end of the 80s called War and Remembrance. Now, I hope you don't take offence at what I'm going to say. No, not a bit. You were cast as Adolf Hitler. Yeah. I thought that was one of the strangest pieces of casting I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Oh, you agree with me? Oh, totally. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought it was... <clears throat> I've got, I don't know what else to say. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think you're alone. I think there might have been one other person thinking like that. <laughs> what, you mean you? Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, that happened. Uh, I heard that they were doing the, you know, the Second World War and making this film called War and Remembrance, and they were looking for you know, Hitler and the Goebbels, Goering and all that. So I thought, I am obviously right for Hitler. Obviously, there's no question. Because I identified with him so much <laughs> because he was a leader and he ruled and invaded countries. I also invaded countries with my theatre group. <laughs> I toured the world. I took my theatre group to Japan, to the Middle East, to Los Angeles, to New York, and I felt and I was in control, I was in charge, I had to be, because I had very, very few su supporters or producers. And therefore I was in charge of this group of very uh, talented, experienced, tough and dynamic actors. And instead of bullets, we used language and we conquered. So in the way, I think to play Hitler, you have to have somebody who's had some degree of personal responsibility over others and had some international experience, which I had in spades. So one day, I went to audition to read, but the, the, the director, his name is Dan Curtis, sadly no longer with us, and I was asked, because they had lots of money, the people to, who auditioned to make up like the character. So they sent me to a hairdresser and got the wig and the moustache. And I had even the suit, costume made, so that I do the audition and they record it. So it was a hot day and he was in his hotel in uh, South Kent on Ipswich. And I went in and I said, oh, hello, Mr. Curtis, you have found your Hitler. Well, he looked at me and I had a bit of a suntan and I was about 30 years younger than now and he looked at me and he wasn't very convinced he said well you know I hope so you want to go in the bathroom and then you can change well I knew I had it and I tell you because I put on the suit and I put on the wig with that reversed kind of hairstyle the parting on the always on the wrong side but the magic, as soon as I put on the little black moustache, oh, it's amazing. It was the little black, that little smudge here, bing. So I, this is wonderful. I put on the suit, I put on the wig. Oh, I don't look too much like Hitler, but get the little smudge out of the thing. It was only that size. Bing. I, I, I exited the room, the bathroom. And I said, um, well, I should do ready for the reading. And they looked at me 
and their jaws dropped because I looked exactly like Hitler. And uh, so much so I didn't even have to act it. But I had to get the accent, of course, to a certain extent. And uh, that's how it happened that I ended up playing Adolf Hitler. Fantastic. I've got one very quick further question, because you said you had to put on um, the, the clothes and all that yes. to dress up as him. Is it true that for your audition for Octopussy, you turned up in a samurai outfit? No, it's not true. <laughs> I have to tell you that a friend of mine who lives in Colorado, USA, asked me to ask you that yes. because he's a Bond devotee and there is clearly some sort of very strange story going around. Yeah, I, well, that, that would like to would really say it's true. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, that, that is... Uh, it's apocryphal. Yes, it's even worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> what, you mean it's bollocks? Bollocks. <laughs> yeah. yeah OK. I, t I, I, said I, I told him I would ask. So. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, would any of you have a question for Mr Burkoff? Yes, Alan. Uh, you appeared in the uh, early 70s series called UFO, playing a, uh, a, a, a pilot. Uh, what do you remember that? I remember nothing. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just wages, and I thought I was destined for something much greater than that. I always felt that bitterly, and I say bitter, using that word, because I had come from a very ordinary working class family in the East End, where I still live as a matter of fact, and we had nothing. We were supported by nobody, but I did have some support. But my ambition was to create wondrous language, wondrous theatre, magical theatre. So doing the UFO, you know, <laughs> sitting with a helmet on, I go, gee, 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 gee. <laughs> well, I always appreciated it. I, I, you know, I was working, going to Pinewood and getting a little wages, but I wouldn't soil my brain with trying to fill it with memories <laughs> and wasting all that valuable cell. <laughs> so it was rejected as soon as I finished it. Next question, please. John. <laughs> Go on. Oh, so it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Um, I, you mentioned earlier Tim Roth, and then you just mentioned your own background before you got into acting. It's often said now that the doors have been closed to working class people getting into the industry. It's getting more and more difficult. I just wonder if you indeed believe that is true, what your thoughts are on it, and what can and should be done about it. And even in schools, things like education and theatre and music, they're the first to be cut in the budget. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I think there's a lot of truth in it, because uh, if you want to be successful, uh, and have a good education and a good go to a good drama school since funds are cut uh, greatly for the major drama schools unless you appear to be a genius it means that working class people cannot even begin to possibly imagine that their mum and dad will pay 20,000 a year to go to RADA or Central impossible but a middle class, upper class, will say, well, it's a lot of money, but I think my son or daughter is capable, and I'll invest in that. And um, so consequently, some of the stronger, younger, working class, virile, excitable, anarchic, desperate, passionate, exceedingly uh, talented, do not have a say. You don't even see them, and what you see on the stage is really, unfortunately, tends to be a little bit overbalanced with the upper class and with the privileged who've been to Ascot, who have been to Cambridge and been to blah, 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 and, um, and all the best schools. And some of that doesn't mean to say they're not talented, some of them are. But there is a vibrancy and there is a grittiness and there is a, a sense of kind of background that you get with a kind of poor or working class person which is not expressed. It was it, during the more liberal 60s 
when under Labour government a lot of money was given to theatres and to actors and the grants were given even to small groups by the Arts Council. That was amazing. And then you had the playwrights like Arnold Wesker, who sort of did one or two very good plays. Harold Pinter was very successful. Suddenly there was a kind of swerve to looking at the kind of habits and adventures and values of working class. And that lasted maybe 10 or 20 years. And then suddenly it became very fashionable to look at Terence Rattigan and Nell Coward. It was very, very good, you know. Yeah, I did the birthday party at school. That was, that was great. Birthday party was good, yeah. yeah. So I think that's happened, and it's happened more and more. And it's not only with actors. It's with playwrights. It's with directors. If you are not, perhaps, part of that system, if you like, it's impossible to get a job. Not totally impossible, because I know one or two people that have managed, but it is not that easy. It becomes a bit of a club. That's not bad, because once you know who the enemy is, you fight. You get people together. I went to the top floor of a pub. I got actors together. I say, there's no money. We we'll work at night. But when I know there's no money to pay you, I know you won't come in unless you are passionately devoted to this. And then we'll make something of it. So with no money, we got together and we had nothing to pay them. So we put together an immense production that wasn't or perhaps highly sophisticated, but it still had a great deal of passion to it. And we rang up the Arts Council looking for a date and they gave us one or two dates. So although there is a privilege of the upper classes, so-called, no old term, um, there is something to be said when you struggle and to do it yourself because you don't want to be part of that gang. You don't want to be standing there on the stage with a spear between your legs. You want to have something more. You don't want a director sitting in front of you talking about, yeah, I'm big pentameters. <laughs> <laughs> and talking for hours while well, the actors get kind of this is the actors they're getting tired and fed up and bored and but they keep talking you know they, they want to show that the actors that they know what they're talking about and it's the most tedious boring so it's good sometimes to be on the other side I um I was talking to someone recently who was talking uh, about the period you're talking when the 60s and 70s and who said that the likes of Rada and, and Weber Douglas and whatever actors who weren't good enough although they, those that they saw did not have the potential would go they, they wouldn't stay on yes. but nowadays this, this ties in which said at 20 grand a year they tell them all that they're wonderful and then they, they go out and they just wasted their money because there is no work for them Yes. and what you've said basically dovetails in with what yeah, I think so yes I think that's true uh, you know, very much true. I mean, if you're just merely being Garada and having the good accent, you, you'll at least have the attention of the, the directors, you know, that, that will certainly make them feel happier. Mm -hmm. that they're amongst the sound you make is more familiar to them. Next question, please. Hello, Stephen. Hi. What are your recollections of uh, working on McVicar? And did you read his book? Oh, yeah. Read the book. Uh, John McVicar, the famous bank robber. And he wrote a book on his life called, I think, just called, was it called McVicar? Yeah. Yeah. It was a brilliant book. It, oh, it was so brilliant and so cutting and so clever and brilliantly observant, although of course he knows his own life. But the way he put it, it was quite thrilling. And um, <coughs> I happened to play in it. I played a chap called um, Ronnie, but I think it was based on Charlie Richardson, who was a famous English gangster, who passed away about five years ago. And Roger Daltrey, the famous pop singer, played McVicar. Now, Daltrey is a wonderful performer. He is like fire and lightning on the stage as a singer. 
<laughs> Especially when he sings those great songs like, feel me, and all that. <laughs> Touch me, and all that. But playing a hard, tough, frightening bank robber called McVicker, who was fearless. The guy is frightening just to look at. I felt there he might have maybe been cast for his name, you know. But uh, otherwise, it was a dreadful film. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from your own performance. Yeah, I, I tried to make something of it. <laughs> the thing is, of course, Daltrey was probably going back to his trout farm after filming each week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because he had one by then, didn't he? He set them up. I think he did, yeah. yeah. But he was a lovely guy to work with. Lovely guy, and he, he's smashing, and I love him. I've been friends with him ever since, and I'm proud to call him a friend. I don't think he thinks that was his best. Can I talk about another friend of yours, Dave Allen? Oh, yes. Who I grew up and just absolutely loved and adored. You, you were good friends with him? Reasonably, yes. He was, he was just, he was a genius. He <laughs> was the man, and of course he got so much flack from the likes of uh, Mary Whitehouse and whatever. He yes. was way ahead of his time. Observational comedy. Oh, yeah, he was very smart about, you know, really piercing hypocrisy and pomposity and it was this lovely simple uh well he had a simple style sitting on a stool like a bar stool and talking and i think he's just talking with his irish accent and saying a lot of things that people would laugh their heads off and admired and respected and thought yeah. god he was so good and um uh, he came to see me in one of my shows once and uh kind of expressed his fascination with what I was doing and then we became friends and he came over and that's how I got to know him. My ultimate memory of him as when I was a kid was when he did his here's the church and of course he was missing half a finger here's the steeple and that, that, it was just oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's like 40 something years ago but that sticks with me and that's great yeah. isn't it that's such a simple thing as that you remember it. Oh yes. Yeah, Less is and, more many, uh, many But more of times course you do remember Mavericks you remember comedians who are mavericks, who are total revolutionaries, satirists, who pierce that kind of bubble of self-protection. And mainly, they're working class comedians. Now, Lee Evans, do you know Lee mm -hmm. Evans? Yeah, yeah. Who has got to be one of the greatest comedians on the planet. This man is a genius. He is a physical genius. Astounding. And at the end of his set, he sits at a piano and plays Bach and Beethoven. You think, God, there's too much talent in one person. <laughs> but he said, I hate, he said, Lee Evans, this lovely, small, brilliant, marvelous, inventive guy, said, I hate middle class comics. Okay, and that's, you know, when you look at it, that's true. And there's a lot of now, it's become more respectable. First of all, you wanted to be an actor to do, you know, Hamlet. But now from Oxford, Cambridge, there's a little to be a, a satiric comedian. And so you're getting a lot of comedians who are from that class mm -hmm. and make satiric comments about things. They're quite funny. <clears throat> and uh, I've now started to take over. So when I suddenly heard him or re read that he said he can't stand middle class comedians, I completely uh, support that. You've given me an in to Doctor Who with five minutes left in our interview because Lee Evans appeared in a 2009 episode oh. called Planet of the Dead oh. and you appeared in an episode called The Power of Three. Yes. Any comments on it? Well... <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was quite an inventive script. I wasn't expecting it to be that inventive. And it was a very, very good script. And I liked the idea in one aspect that by using masks, and they painted my face and did or use all sorts of prosthetics, that you change not only your person, your face, but your interior. And there's something quite magical. It's like reminded me of the early Italian comedia dell'arte where they used mm -hmm. masks. So I liked that aspect of it that when you had this face, suddenly you become a different being. And I like that. <laughs> and so that was fine, and we got on. What I did notice, 
Um, now, Doctor Who, it's not BBC, oh. is it? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. I did notice that when they gave me my per diem, you know, to buy my dinner at night or something, it was like £10. It hasn't changed, has it, over the years? <laughs> I thought, how can they be so effing mean? <laughs> how but can they be so rottenly tight-fisted? <laughs> I could not. This, this astonished me, actually. Maybe they thought that restaurants are cheaper in Cardiff? Will you just have a hamburger? Yeah. <laughs> of course, Comedi... Uh, sorry, I'll come to you. Comedi dell'arte was the basis of pantomime, isn't it? Yes. Which is something that I've done on an amateur basis for yes, a very long course, time. Yes, of course, yes. And so I completely understand where you're coming from. Right, yes. Yes, Alan, sorry. Uh, you're in Clockwork Orange. What do you recall from that? I recall, because it was my early, earliest film, practically, um, Stanley Kubrick standing there, very calm and serene. It was a scene I played a copper, and only Stanley Kubrick would cast me as a copper, but I played this young copper, and I wanted to be good, and I wanted not to let him down. So consequently, I had a few lines, and I went over these lines over and over and over again in my head, because I noticed that Kubrick chastised one actor who didn't know his lines. And the actor had the stupidity to say, well, Stanley, I, I don't like to learn them till we've plotted the scene, and I know which lines go with what movement. And Kubrick said, no, you don't do that. You learn the lines. That is your material. That's your tools. You have your lines no matter what we do with it. So I thought, I'm not going to miss a single line. Um, so I went over the lines, and I had these lines with uh, the young actor, William, uh, what was his name? Oh, uh, Malcolm McDowell? Malcolm McDowell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just went over the lines over and over, and I said, I can still remember them to this day. This kept going. So I went over to him and said, who's been a naughty boy then? <laughs> <laughs> so I went over a few lines like that. I went, kept going over them, we could cut. Do another take, bang up the lines. Cut, do another take, bang up the lines. <laughs> Even when I'm at lunch, going over the lines, the lines, the lines, the lines. And then, after I finished the film, I suffered from compulsive obsessive disorder. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't stop going over the lines. It was terrible. But I remember Stanley being sedate, calm, elegant, and delightful to, to work with. OK. I'm afraid that 45 minutes has absolutely flown by. Can I say what a privilege it has been to interview you, Stephen? Oh, thank you very and much. All the very best for the future. Thank you. Thank you.